The internet is a big place, a big place full of mysteries. Some are stupid, some are creepy, most are just bored people looking way too hard into a topic that's really not that deep to begin with. I'm Dantavius, how you doing? And today we're going to be talking about the biggest mysteries on the internet. And yes, it's an iceberg video. If you don't know what an iceberg video is, go f*** yourself. No, I'm kidding. It's just a way to sort information from most known to least known. So we're going to start with topics that are pretty commonly known. And we're going to end off with stuff that you've probably never heard of. And I know I said I wasn't going to do another one. But if you listen closely to what I was saying, I said, This is my last iceberg video I'm doing this year. It's a new year now, baby. New year, new me. Which means another iceberg. That being said, this will be the last one I do. It's over after this, man. It's over. Well, technically it's not over because this is a two-part video. This is part one of part two. If you guys are interested in watching part two, once you're done watching this video, uh, please uh, subscribe with notifications on. Don't do it yet, though. All right, finish the video. If you like it, you can do it at that point. But yeah, man, shout out to Fergie, the one and only, who created this iceberg chart. If you want to follow along with me, I put a link to it in the description. And before I start the video, I want to introduce you guys to a term, ARG. Just in case you aren't familiar with an ARG, it's an alternate reality game. They basically combine real life and a video game. It's kind of like an internet scavenger hunt. Most ARGs consist of somebody posting cryptic messages on the internet, usually to 4chan or Reddit, and people try to decipher the message and find clues. It's kind of hard to explain, but the first entry in this list is an example of an ARG. But yeah, let's just jump in. Cicada3301 is a mysterious organization who has posted multiple cryptic puzzles on the internet. The first of these puzzles was an image posted on 4chan. The image was a simple JPEG with the text, Hello, we are looking for highly intelligent individuals. Well, I'm out. To find them, we have devised a test. There is a message hidden in this image. Find it and it will lead you to the road to finding us. We look forward to meeting the few that will make it all the way through. Good luck. 3301. Eventually some big brain mother sucker was able to solve the puzzle and I'm not gonna bore you with the specifics, but he basically found a clue in the metadata of the image which led him to a series of more clues that eventually led to a telephone number which would then play this pre-recorded message. This is an automatic voice message from Habernam Health Services. Your genital herpes test has come back positive. Please call us back at your earliest convenience to discuss treatment options. Oh shit, sorry, that was the wrong recording. Very good. You have done well. There are three prime numbers associated with the original final .jpeg image. 3301 is one of them. You will have to find the other two. Multiply all three of these numbers together and add a .com on the end to find the next step. Good luck. Goodbye. Now this eventually led to some sets of coordinates. The coordinates corresponded to locations in Russia, Spain, Japan, Poland, among other places. If you were to go to these coordinates, you would see a picture of a cicada with a QR code, which of course led to another set of clues. And it was at this point, people started to realize this wasn't just some schmuck with too much free time living in his mom's basement doing all of this. It was a sophisticated group operating out of multiple countries. After about a month of being posted, the original picture was was changed to another one which said that they found people who they were looking for and that there would be more opportunities. And there were. Cicada posted two more puzzles. The second one was posted a year later and solved, but the third one, posted in 2014, still hasn't been solved to this day. So if you think you got what it takes, try to figure it out. And we're still pretty clueless on what Cicada 3301 might be. Like, are they Mr. Robot? Are they a government entity? Or just some billionaire screwing around with people? There's a ton of theories on their possible origin, but I think it's something more than just a group of 4chan neckbeards, just because they did such a good job at setting up this scavenger hunt and remained anonymous and somehow convinced the people who figured out the puzzles to not spill the beans. Blankroomsoup.avi, in 2005, a disturbing video titled Freaky Soup Guy was posted to YouTube, where a guy eats soup while crying. Okay, that was, uh, that was some creepy shit, man. Also, I gotta respect the video delivered exactly on what the title described. No clickbait at all. This is truly a creepy soup guy. But man, everything about this gives me Squid Game vibes, and you're probably wondering, what are those masks that those two guys are wearing? Well, it's actually a character called Ray Ray, created by Raymond Percy, who is an animator, director, and voice actor known for his work with Disney. Now, the Ray Ray character is frequently used in performance art pieces like this one.
and they even do a yearly performance at every Burning Man event. All right, well, there we go. We figured out the mystery. It's just performance art. Or is it? The thing is, Raymond Percy himself claims that he did not make the Blank Room Soup video and that neither him or anyone who's involved with Ray Ray had anything to do with it. According to him, the suits were stolen from his car during a performance. And this led to the rumor that it's actually a snuff film that was originally uploaded to the dark web and that the man was kidnapped and forced to eat caca soup for some deranged psychos. Now, let me read you a snippet from an article about the Freaky Soup Guy video on Freaklore.com. Another theory is that this video is some kind of art project, although that's highly unlikely. Another theory is that Percy himself set up all of this for publicity, although that is rather doubtful. So, let's recap real quick. A known performance artist happens to have his costume stolen and then used in a film that looks suspiciously like performance art. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a mystery at all, to be honest. People really want this to be something more than it is, but you, you gotta understand. Performance artists are some of the weirdest mother suckers on this planet, and there's no doubt that this is all it is. You know, I'm actually kind of mad that I wasted so much time researching this just for some bullshit. Next! Polybius was an old school arcade machine that appeared in arcades in the Portland area around 1981. The game was said to be extremely fast paced, featuring geometric patterns and bright colors. Many people who played it were instantly addicted and couldn't stop playing. It was also said to induce psychoactive effects like seizures, amnesia, insomnia, and hallucinations. Even worse, one guy who played it even tried to off himself. And Others said they couldn't control their own thoughts. After about a month, the game disappeared as quickly as it appeared, disappointing dozens of sweaty neckbeards who spent an entire afternoon digging for quarters in their ass crack. While it was active, men in black suits came in once a week to come and collect data from the machine. They didn't even bother taking the change, and no traces of the machines were left after the initial debut. And I think you know where I'm about to go with this. MKUltra was a government-sanctioned mind control research and experimentation project carried out by the CIA from 1953 to 1973, in which scientists developed drugs, chemicals, and technologies to attempt to control or read people's minds. I mean, I've talked about this in pretty much every Iceberg video I've made. If you guys don't know about MKUltra by now, you're an absolute putz. Now, assuming that Polybius was actually real, and assuming that MK Ultra didn't end in 1973, it's entirely plausible that the video game was created as a part of MK Ultra in an attempt to make people more susceptible to mind control. Or my personal theory, that those games were installed by Nintendo so they could research new ways to get people addicted to video games. Now, there were always whispers every now and then about a killer video game from Portland, but there was no widespread knowledge of Polybius until February 6th of 2000 when somebody made a post about it on coinop.org, which was a website dedicated to old school arcade gaming. In the post, he gives details about the game and even provides a screenshot of the title screen. Now, other than this one post and a few anecdotal stories and urban legends, we really don't have much to go off of to say that if this was real or not. But then again, it might just be a really good cover-up. Markovian Parallax Denigrate. This shit sounds like a Skyrim character or something, bro. So, Markovian Parallax Denigrate, or MPD, is the internet's oldest mystery. So back before Google even existed, there was this thing called Usenet, which was kind of like a precursor to modern day forums. Think of it as Reddit before Reddit. In 1996, the forums began to get spammed with hundreds of bizarre posts consisting of what looks like gibberish. The only thing they all shared was the title Markovian Parallax Denigrate, and since people thought these were just spam, nobody thought to save them or anything, so most of them have disappeared from the internet, except for one. And as you can see, this shit makes less sense than the popularity of The Office. Now, a lot of people speculated that these were coded messages of some kind, but despite any attempts over the years to crack the code, no one has been able to. Where it gets even crazier is that the sender's email address is Susan Lindauer, who was a former journalist and congressional staffer. Lindauer was an outspoken critic of the Bush administration's sanctions on Iraq and other Middle Eastern countries. She began to form close relationships with leaders of the Arab governments like Libya and Iraq and started lobbying on their behalf. Her brother and a close friend of hers both claimed she warned them to avoid New York City just before 9-11 and in 2004 she was arrested for acting as an agent of a foreign government after she flew to Baghdad in 2002 and received $10,000 from government officials there. She claims the arrest was made to silence her because she knew the truth about 9-11, which she claimed was an inside job. She would spend two years in jail before a federal judge declared her unfit to stand trial, stating she suffered from serious paranoia and delusions of grandeur. Now, listen, I'm not a conspiracy guy or anything like that, but I think 
that if someone was trying to cover this up, the smart thing to do would be to declare her insane. Because if she gets life in prison or the Epstein treatment, it just gives her more credibility. But then again, so does this in a way, so never mind, forget what I said. But anyways, let's get back to MPD. Apparently, after it started to circulate that she was the author of these messages, the Wikipedia article for Markovian Parallax Denigrate mysteriously disappeared. Pretty fishy if you ask me, man. I gotta be honest, when I first started looking into this, I was convinced this was just a spam bot, but this is a whole ass rabbit hole, man. John Titor is a man who made a series of posts on the Time Travel Institute, a website dedicated to theories and concepts related to time travel. His first post was a reply to a question asking, what would happen if you banged your own grandma or something like that? I wasn't really paying attention, honestly. He claimed that the first time machine was built by GE and that he had a schematic of it, which he actually posted. Eventually, people started questioning him on his time travel experiences and a Q&A was set up in the comments. He claimed to be a soldier from the year 2036 and he went back to the year 2000 to recover an IBM 5100 to debug legacy computer programs in his year. He also told us about the future and all the events leading up to it. A civil war would break out in 2005 which lasted for 10 years. Soon after the civil war the Russians would nuke major US cities and after those events Omaha Nebraska would become the new US capital. Now as far as I'm aware None of these things actually happen, but some people say that's because John warned us. Like, there's some people who still believe this shit without a doubt. Unfavorable Semicircle was a strange YouTube channel that posted a metric shit ton of videos in 2015. In a 10 month span, the account posted about 80,000 videos. These videos ranged in length from a few seconds to 11 hours. Most of the videos consisted of a solid colored background with some pixels scattered around here and there. But later videos had weird abstract images with no clear meaning. The videos were mostly silent except for the occasional spurt of distorted audio that sounded it's kind of like a man's voice saying something. I don't really know how to explain it. Let me just show you. Man, why is this giving me the heebie-jeebies? Uh, the people were able to find hidden things in some of these videos, like images that were hidden in the videos themselves. Also, people discovered that if you take some of the individual frames from the videos, they formed larger composite images. This is what really freaked me out for some reason. But these images are just as cryptic as the videos themselves. The titles of the videos usually started with the astrological symbol for Sagittarius. Now, eventually YouTube deleted this channel due to spamming, but most of the videos were archived. The YouTube account was also linked to a Twitter account that has also since been deleted. Of course, all this weirdness led to multiple theories as to the meaning of it all. Some people are saying it's similar to Cicada, that it's a cryptograph used to recruit only the most succulent of minds. Other people say, it's just a simple case of trolling. And of course, aliens. You know, I feel like aliens can be an explanation to anything remotely weird. Like, oh, there's a weird light in the sky. That's That's gotta be aliens. There's a sound I've never heard before. Aliens. Dang, I woke up this morning and my ass was hurting. Must have been aliens. <clears throat> Soul with Firth Spaceman is referring to this image of a little girl with what looks to be an extraterrestrial in the background. And for years and years, people looked at this image and were like, whoa, man, this is definitive proof of the existence of aliens. But in fact, it was just the girl's mom looking the other direction. I feel like this is most internet mysteries. Like people look way too much into it when the explanation is actually very simple. This man. In 2008, a website called thisman.org was created. The landing page of the site had a picture of this man with the title ever dream this man every night throughout the world hundreds of people dream about this face man this kind of looks like my uncle yanni from back in the old country i mean look at this shlomil bro if i ever dreamt about this mother sucker i'll punch him right in the face the backstory of the image is this in new york a patient of a psychiatrist draws the face of a man she's seen repeatedly in her dreams the portrait sat on the psychiatrist's desk for a few days until another patient recognizes the face and says that he also often saw this man appear in his dreams after dreaming about him he would awaken in a puddle of unspecified liquid okay i made that last part up but let's keep going the psychiatrist sent this portrait to some of his colleagues and asked them to show it to their patients who have recurrent dreams surprisingly four patients recognized the man from their own dreams and apparently over 2,000 people saw this man so the website was dedicated to gather information about this phenomenon several theories were presented as possible explanations of this and I'm just gonna list them on the screen. Now, it turns out that this entire website was part of an elaborate ad campaign. For what product, you may ask? The answer is Skillshare, an online learning platform with thousands of ad-free classes to help you jumpstart your creativity.
Hey man, are you sick and tired of sitting in your room night after night crying because life has no meaning? Every day's the same. You come home after work or school, you play video games, you sleep, and then you repeat everything the next day. You know what you need? A hobby. But the thing about hobbies is you gotta learn them. And nobody wants to learn, right? So you might as well give up, right? Wrong, okay? You're lucky you're watching this video right now because I'm about to introduce you to Skillshare. Let's say you want to be a YouTuber like your good friend Dan Tavius. Well, what helped me become the man I am today is a Skillshare course by none other than Mark Ass Brownie. I've recommended this course before and guess what? I'll do it again because it's excellent at breaking down everything you need to know to get started with whatever you have, all right? You don't need a thousand dollar camera in a studio. You can get started with just your phone and some charisma. Oh. You don't have charisma? Well, they have classes for that too. As a matter of fact, they have classes for tons of things. Video editing, organizational skills, even coding. The only thing they don't have a class on is how to get my kids back from my ex-wife. Oh, and did I mention there's no ads? All right, uninterrupted learning? You kidding me, bro? So why not invest in yourself? Because at the end of the day, you got to start somewhere. And luckily, the first thousand of you beautiful schmucks to click the link in the description gets one month free. So go ahead. Give it a try, start exploring your creativity today. The mystery of what happened to my dad. June 5th, 1987, I was seven years old at the time. I was a bit of a handful as a child. Psychiatrists said that I was emotionally unstable and prone to violent and psychopathic tendencies. Whatever that means. I came home after a long day of setting fires around the neighborhood and wanted to fix myself a nice bowl of crunch berries. There was one issue, no milk. At this point, I had a full-blown mental breakdown and started smashing stuff, punching a dog in the face, you know, regular kid stuff, lashing out. At one point, my dad says, okay, okay, I'm gonna get you some milk, just calm down, please. I calmed down a little, but I never saw my dad after that. I'm still trying to figure out why he left. Was it something I did? No, nah, no, nah, couldn't be. I guess we may never know. Elisa Lam, okay, we're going from funny to very disturbing. Elisa Lam was a student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver who decided she wanted to get away from her studies by taking a trip to the West Coast. Unfortunately, this trip would not end well for Elisa. Elisa suffered from bipolar disorder and depression, and for this reason, her parents did not approve of her going on a long trip by herself. But eventually they caved and let her go on, on the condition that she would call them every day so that they would know she was okay. So she packed her bags and took the Amtrak all the way from Canada to Los Angeles where she would stay at the Hotel Cecil. This was a charming little hotel with a view of Skid Row, one of the largest homeless encampments in the United States. Now, I feel I should mention that this particular hotel is an absolute cesspit. And I don't mean that it's your standard rat infested dirty shithole, I mean this place was notorious for the large number of people who took their own lives within its walls. On top of that it was also known for violence, prostitution, murder, and home to at least two serial killers, including possibly Richard Ramirez the Night Stalker. And if all this wasn't bad enough, there was also a group of people emulating Nintendo games in there. When Lamb initially came to the Cecil she was put in a shared hostile style room with multiple people, but her roommates complained to management that she she was displaying odd behavior, so she was moved to her own private room instead. And this wasn't the only time someone would claim that she was behaving strangely. Apparently she was kicked out of a taping of a late show for disruptive behavior. After a few days of being in the city, all of a sudden she wasn't calling her parents anymore. This alarmed her parents who were protective of her because of her mental condition, so they called the police to report her missing. The police searched the entire hotel for Elisa, but she was nowhere to be seen. This was the last known footage of her. This video sparked a lot of speculation on the internet, probably because of her odd movements and behavior. Some people say that it looked like she was trying to hide from someone or was frantic because the elevator seemed to be malfunctioning when she was trying to run away from an unknown person. There were even some theories that the video was tampered with before being posted. While the police were searching for Elisa, a bunch of other guests at the Cecil began to complain about the water pressure. Others claimed that the water was slightly darker than usual and that it had a weird taste. 
This was when a maintenance worker went up to check the water tanks on the roof, and when he looked inside, he found Elisa's body in one of them. Her passing away was deemed to be from drowning, and no drugs or signs of a struggle were found on her body. This caused people to speculate even more. How did she get on the roof? How did she get into the tank? Like, everything was locked, normal you know guests at the hotel had no access to this part from people who knew her it was very hard to believe that she would do this to herself because elisa was not known to be inclined to thoughts of ending her life and one of the last people who saw her was a bookstore owner who said she was outgoing very lively and very friendly she also bought gifts for her family and friends in canada the day she went missing why would someone who was planning on ending themselves do that? In my opinion, I think Elisa wasn't taking her bipolar medication and began to have paranoid thoughts that someone was after her. This would explain the weird footage on the elevator and why it seemed like she was looking around for somebody. She also apparently had a history of paranoid episodes, so I think she ran onto the roof and tried to hide in one of these water tanks where she drowned. I'm open to other theories, but I think this one's the most likely. Grave robbing for morons. Let me take you young whippersnappers back to an age before the internet. You know, these days, if you want to watch a video without paying for it, you just fire up the old pirate bay, type in whatever you're looking for, and like magic, hundreds of potentially virus infested downloads pop up, and you're on your way to watching according to Jim with Chinese subtitles. But before the internet, we had these things called bootlegs, which were essentially physical versions of torrents. Most bootlegs were just people recording a movie with their shitty camera and putting it on a VHS, but there were also weirder and more disturbing videos to be found on the bootleg black market. One of these videos was titled, Ensuring Your Place in HE Double Hockey Sticks. It was a compilation of strange home movies, and one of these movies was a 27 minute long video called Grave Robbing for Morons, where a young man with a speech impediment gives instructions on how to, well, rob graves. He also goes into detail on how to clean bones so you can sell them on the black market. The whole time he's talking, he's holding what looks to be a very real skull. Now, a lot of people speculate that this was some kind of pretentious art film or a school film project or something like that, but I actually think it might be real. I want to point out a few details about this video. First of all, the kid says in the video that his name is Anthony, and at one point it looks like he's about to say his last name. This was made by, uh, by Anthony, I guess, uh, uh, well, as a matter of fact, let's forget the last name. So you can clearly hear that he said Anthony Cass and then stopped. Now, this is where it gets interesting. In 1999, a man named Anthony Casamassina was arrested for, you guessed it, grave robbing. Now, I'm no detective, but... I think we found our guy. Owen Hye's final video. Owen Hye was a South Korean actress and model who also did vlogs on YouTube. On September 14, 2020, at the age of 36, she was found unconscious by a friend who took her to the hospital, but sadly she would later pass from cardiac arrest. According to the coroner, it was self-inflicted. A couple of days before this, she would post a vlog on YouTube, and at first glance, it seems perfectly normal, nothing out of the ordinary. But after about 45 seconds, there's a weird glitch that lasts for about a minute. Now, this is pretty unsettling to watch for some reason, and this glitch in her video has caused a lot of theories to come forward that this was some kind of sign or warning or message regarding her passing away. It did seem a little suspicious that this one video in particular would glitch right before she passed, and other people also point to the fact that it looked like she was chopping at her neck with the comb. I should also point out that she was aware of the buffering and acknowledged it. She was also known to edit her own videos, so she must have noticed it before uploading, right? And the weirdness doesn't stop there. In here, it would include the number of the video in each one of her video's titles, like episodes. Her first video was episode one, and so on and so forth. Now, the video she made before she passed was titled episode 48, but the one right before it was episode 45, so she skipped three numbers. A lot of conspiracies surrounding this video have to do with the number 48. If you look at the comments of this video, some people listed all of the coincidences found. First of all, the video started glitching at exactly 48 seconds and then goes on for exactly 1 minute until 1.48. Then if you look at the clock behind her, the time reads 8.30, which means the hour hand is on 8, the minute hand is on 6, 8 multiplied by 6 is 48. She also died 48 hours after this video, and this was the 48th episode. Also, the previous video, 
episode 45, at the 4 minute and 8 second mark, you can see the number 48 being repeated on screen. Somebody also claims that the glitch was actually Morse code and that she was saying, I need help, 48 is here help me now, but that's unconfirmed. So the idea here is that either she was sending a message that she was gonna carry out the deed herself, or she knew somebody was after her and she was hoping somebody would notice and decode her messages. Cause apparently she did have issues with some people in the Korean entertainment industry. I mean, when you put everything together, it's pretty suspicious. But I'm not gonna lie, at the same time, these theories kind of come off like the Lincoln JFK coincidences, like, oh, Lincoln was shot in a theater named Ford, Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln, which is made by Ford. Anyways, whatever happened, man, I hope she rests in peace. This one is particularly sad, I think. 11BX1371. In 2015, a very creepy video was posted on Swedish tech news site GadgetZZ after it was apparently sent to them in the mail from an unknown person in Poland. Now, at this point, I'm a little bit skeptical because as you know, in Poland, Poland, it's illegal to send mail without also sending a kielbasa sausage attached to it. But let's forget about that and continue. The video in question was black and white footage of a guy in a plague doctor mask with distorted sounds playing in the background and a bunch of weird numbers and symbols flashing on the screen periodically. There was a bunch of hidden clues throughout the video and many people on the internet dedicated what I would describe as too much time trying to decipher them. Two months later, another video would be uploaded to YouTube by somebody named Parker Wright. The video featured the same plague doctor doing weird shit again, and this one featured more clues. After a bunch of theories about prophecies and aliens and shit like that, the man who created these videos came out and said that these videos were in fact an ARG made by Parker Wright as an art project. Satoshi Nakamoto. Again, I talked about this guy in the Mysterious People Iceberg. He's one of the richest people on the planet due to being the creator of Bitcoin. You remember Bitcoin, right? It's that thing you decided to invest your life savings in a few months ago because you thought it would make you rich, but then it lost 50% of its valuation soon after and now you're sitting here broke and sad watching an iceberg video crying while facing bankruptcy. Anyways, no one knows who Satoshi is. Some people think he's an agent of the Russian or Chinese governments. Other people think he might be Satoshi Nakamoto a Japanese American living in California, who just so happens to not only have the expertise to create something like Bitcoin, but is also against government regulations, which falls in line completely with what Bitcoin stands for. But nah, man, can't be that guy. Probably aliens, honestly. Charlie Chaplin Time Traveler. This refers to a clip from a Charlie Chaplin film, The Circus at Grumman's Chinese Theater, made in 1928, where you can briefly see a woman seemingly talking on a cell phone. Media sources have tried to explain this away as the thing on her ear being a hearing aid, which was actually developed by Western Electric in 1925. But I think there's a more obvious answer. She is a time traveler. She went back in time to kill Hitler, but went back too far, and now she's calling back to the future to tell them that they fucked up and they got the wrong guy with the weird mustache. 9-11 predictions in media. So the 9-11 predictions in media are kind of similar to the Onhe coincidences that I mentioned earlier or the Lincoln Kennedy coincidences. Before September 11th, many films, TV shows, and songs seem to have predicted 9-11 including but not limited to The Matrix, where Neo's passport expires on September 11th, 2001. Okay, that could very easily be a coincidence. There's also The Simpsons, where Lisa holds up this magazine. Well, The Simpsons predicts everything, so that doesn't really count. Okay, how about this scene from the Rugrats in Paris movie? Nine eleven was a national tragedy. Okay, that's it's a little bit weird. Chucky clearly says nine eleven, and then a plane flies into what looks like two towers. But let's say that's that's not anything either. So let's talk about Back to the Future. Back to the Future is a film that is notoriously really bad at predicting the future. Except that apparently it predicted 9-11, I guess. Like, somebody made a whole ass 12 minute long video on all the coincidences that appear in Back to the Future. The clock in the background secretly depicts the number 9-11, with the hour hand occupying the ninth window, and the minute hand resting in the 11th window. Marty is desperately yelling, I have to tell you about the future, while the clock says 9-11. And what is Marty trying to warn Doc about? A terrorist attack. The terrorist ambush occurs here, in the parking lot of the Twin Pines Mall. Of the multitude of names that this scene could have had, why is it called the Twin Pines Mall? It will soon become clear that this scene is supposed to represent September the 11th. 
twin is a reference to the twin towers. And when we look closely, we can see that the clock at this scene also says 9-11. Now, at first, I really did not understand the implication with these conspiracy theories. Is it that all these people had inside information on 9-11? That it was going to happen? They were trying to warn people in the shittiest way possible? Like, why did the Simpsons guy need to know that 9-11 was going to happen? Well, I dug into it a little bit more, and it turns out that this is a concept called predictive programming. Predictive programming is a way to subconsciously condition people into being mentally prepared for a catastrophic event. This is done to prevent a hostile reaction or wide-scale panic and rioting, you know, things of that nature. Chip Chan is a Korean woman who over the course of 10 years was live streaming on various platforms basically 24-7. During her stream, she just sits around her apartment browsing the internet and sleeping and is known to have signs around her room asking viewers for help. But help from what? Okay, this is gonna get pretty intense. So Chip claims that a man known only as P is holding her captive against her will in her apartment. P is supposedly a corrupt police officer who set up these cameras to monitor her at all times. As far as I can tell, no one who watches her live streams has ever seen P and nobody knows what this man's true motives are. She also claims that she is microchipped with a mind control device that's located just under her ankle. She says that this chip allows P to hear what she's thinking and control her movements and it keeps her from leaving the apartment. She also believes that P can put her to sleep with this device. Now, viewers of her live stream have tried to contact the Korean authorities, but they said that they already knew about Chan and that she is a mentally ill woman who's a nuisance to the police department. But she says the police don't wanna do anything because they're corrupt and, you know, P is a part of them. So obviously the whole department itself is part of this, you know, huge conspiracy to keep her locked up in this apartment. Now, she was streaming continuously on YouTube for a long time on the account Control Weapon Mind, but suddenly stopped streaming on October 16, 2021, which led many people to think that she either went missing, offed herself, or was taken somewhere by P. The description of the last live stream has a bunch of stuff talking about Pig or P breaking into her house and doing terrible things to her. She also said that the pig shut down the streaming to hide the secret of MCW or mind control weapon. Then a few months later on February 25th, 2020, she began posting videos again, but not live streams this time. The first video she posted upon coming back was titled, I was shot with a mind control weapon causing heat rash at the same spot repeatedly, skin's going to rot. The description goes on to say, corrupt Korean cop P stalking me using mind control weapon make me unconscious. The video itself depicts her legs with what looks like some pretty bad burns. To this day, she continues to post multiple videos per day of her legs, showing them scabbing over after the burns. And it's some pretty graphic stuff that I would not suggest looking at. All of this is absolutely terrifying and fucked up. It actually makes me sad because this woman is obviously incredibly mentally ill. There's a post on Reddit that kind of sums everything up pretty well, I think. Stop proposing to go save Chip. She's a paranoid schizophrenic. Many people have reached out to her and all that's been accomplished is worsening her paranoia. Mental health care does not really exist in South Korea, but Chip is not alone. It is believed P is a health care agent that helps her, and it's been said that her landlord and the local police know about her and help her as well. Yeah, man, that's really sad because, you know, apparently in Korea, if she doesn't go out to seek the help herself, she's not going to get it. But let's do a little bit of a palate cleanser after that intense one. Burger King foot lettuce. So this is a photo of his guy putting his nasty ass shoes in two lettuce bins with the caption, this is the lettuce you eat at Burger King. Now, the mystery surrounding this photo was, who the F is this guy? Well, people on 4chan actually figured it out. They looked at the metadata for the photo and figured out that the photo was taken in Mayfield Heights, Ohio. So they began calling local news outlets in Ohio and eventually the guy who took the photo got fired. You may have heard of this event from this clip from the YouTuber Chills. Number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you'd want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus, but as it turns out, that might be what you get. UVB76, also known as The Buzzer, is a Russian radio station that continuously broadcasts a series of short buzzing sounds. You can actually find a live stream that plays it 24-7 on YouTube. Supposedly, the station started broadcasting all the way back in 1982, and on its own, it's not too interesting. Kind of weird, sure, but every now and then, this station will play some weird stuff. For example, every now and then a Russian voice will come on and start saying codes.
Recently, as in last month, the signal was hijacked by pirates who played a sound to make the wavelength look like troll face. Alright bro, that's pretty epic, I'm not gonna lie. On top of that, they also played Gangnam Style over the broadcast. <laughs> Bro, just when I thought this couldn't get any more epic. You know, the only thing that would make this even more epic is... Holy smokes, is that... Is that Big Chungus? Yay video games. I actually skipped this one on my disturbing Reddit post iceberg, so good thing I get to cover it here. This story starts off with the Reddit post 11 years ago from the r slash gaming subreddit with the title, Just got Oblivion for PC, what are your favorite mods? A user by the name of Yay Video Games commented, The uninstall button. The game is great and all, but god it's hard to fully remove all the junk it leaves behind on your system. Another user replied to his comment with, what? He replies back with, the uninstall button, the game is great, Ubisoft goes Steamworks bye bye, always on DRM, but you off to go work, always on work DR, check out the junk it leaves behind in you. The other user then says, this makes even less sense, Oblivion has an uninstall button, it works, I have used it more times than I care to mention, all mods uninstall themselves in Oblivion's directory. The uninstall button doesn't touch them as it is unaware, all you do is delete the Oblivion directory, then they gone bye bye. Yay Video Games would then proceed to bombard the entire reddit thread with the same variation of the words Ubisoft's goes Steamworks bye bye always on DRM. He posted probably 100 comments of that nature on this thread before moving on to other threads posting the same weird messages, sometimes accompanied by these creepy photos. He made probably hundreds, possibly thousands of posts on the gaming subreddit. The weird thing is, after all those nonsensical comments, he posted a few comments that were perfectly normal and not out of the ordinary at all. And then after a few normal comments, he went right back to the spam. Now I'm gonna skip a few steps. Nexpo made an incredibly detailed video about this guy. He did a deep dive and came to the conclusion that this guy suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome for years and was in a constant state of pain to the point of being bedridden. He started experimenting with different treatments to help manage his pain and his outburst on Reddit was the result of being under the influence of one of these treatments. And this theory was corroborated by Yay Video Games' best friend who said that sadly he took his own life in 2015 because he just couldn't deal with the pain anymore. Some heartbreaking shit man, you know, I try to disconnect from these topics, but doing a deep dive on this one really got to me, I gotta be honest. Eratos, I'm warning you right now, do not search up this word. Do not search up the word Eratos, E-R-R-A-T-A-S. This word right here, okay? Do not Google it. Eratus is a computer program which is supposedly used by giant corporations as a type of spyware. According to theories, if anybody searches up the word, they are subject to having their data surveilled. It's suspected that the main function of this algorithm is to scrub the internet of copyright infringement or for companies like Google to develop some sort of AI. It's not exactly known. The main thing you gotta know about Eratus is that if you search up this word, it's watching you. Bet you wish you listened to me now, don't you fuckface. See what happens when you don't listen to me? Anyways, like most things on the internet, this one started off on 4chan, where somebody made a post describing how a friend of his found a tape gun at work. Most of the tape guns in the office had the name of the specific department written on them, but this one in particular that she found had the word Eratas written on it. Her coworker told her to get rid of the tape gun and not mention it to anyone, since apparently the developers at his job were writing code to flag any employee that searched for it on any computer system, and if you got flagged, you got fired. After this was posted, many people shared similar stories, but then the rabbit hole goes deeper. A YouTuber known as Cronus for Life Jurassic Park posted a video titled Jurassic Park 3 Tribute, which was just scenes of Jurassic Park set to R. Kelly's remix to Ignition for some reason. But that's not the interesting part. At the end of the video, you can hear a series of beeps that don't seem to fit in with the video. People figured out that this was Morse code and translated it. The message was Hollywood Astral Projection Clinic. It's pretty dubious man, I might say, that's quite dubious indeed. He then followed up this video with another video titled YouTube is monitoring and controlling my life. Me too man. 
Me too. This video was purposely made shitty and hard to read so that the Errata's algorithm couldn't flag it, but people were able to decipher the text throughout the video. I strongly believe my mom was being monitored and harassed by YouTube, Universal Pictures, and their affiliates because of a secret of sorts she had uncovered within one of the original trilogy of Jurassic Park films. Now he doesn't specify what the secret was, but he does say that YouTube kept removing her videos for no reason. He also posted another video called Here Goes Nothing, which he stated it was a test to see if YouTube would remove it and that it would prove his theory correct if they did remove it. But they didn't remove it, so does that mean your theory is not correct? But that's not where the weirdness ends. If you would turn on the auto captions of this video, they would have all sorts of weird things hidden in them. One of the things being overthrow the government. Keep in mind that auto captions are set by YouTube themselves and cannot be edited by outside sources. So this right here really made me pucker my booty hole. This was when I was like, okay, maybe there is something suspicious going on. Evil Stick was a toy that could be bought from certain dollar stores. At first, it looks like your standard cheap ass princess one. Well, I'll just play a news broadcast explaining further. A mother bought her toddler this princess wand at the dollar store behind me. Imagine her surprise when the curious little girl peeled back the foil to find this image of a girl cutting herself inside. The packaging promises fairies and quote wonderful music, but I doubt many people would call this music. <laughs> It's difficult to see the image clearly in the dark, but if you pull back the foil, there's no mistaking it. And if you look close enough, it's not a drawing. It's an actual picture of the girl. <laughs> okay, that's pretty messed up. I'm not saying it's not messed up, but... Okay, I shouldn't be laughing, but come on, man. That's kind of funny. It's also called fucking Evil Stick. Did you not ask yourself why this would be named an Evil Stick? Kanye Quest 3030 Cult. Now, many of you probably don't know this about me. But I'm a Kanye stan, okay? I've listened to every song he's ever made at least five times. I sold my children into indentured servitude in Qatar for a pair of lightly used Yeezys. And I excuse his shitty behavior on the grounds of him being an eccentric genius. Some people say Kanye has a cult-like following, which is true. But this takes it even a step further. Kanye Quest 3030 is an RPG Maker game that has no official affiliation with Kanye West. The premise of this game is that one day Kanye goes to take the trash out. While doing so, he gets sucked into a wormhole and gets teleported to the year 3030, where the world is ruled by a clone of the rapper Lil B the Bass God. The gameplay is similar to Pokemon, except instead of Pokemon, you rap battle clones of other famous rappers. And once you beat them, you can get them to join your team and fight alongside you. From what I can tell, the the game looks pretty fun and there's a ton of jokes and references to hip hop culture. But then two years after the game's initial release, people discovered some weird stuff. So towards the beginning of the game, there's this random side character who asks you, what do you want to do? And a keyboard pops up so you can give him an answer. At this point, I would type in D's nuts, but unfortunately there's not enough space for these nuts to fit. So at this point, I guess I would just give up and continue on with the game. But it was discovered that if instead of these nuts, you typed in the word ascend, you would be turned into a butterfly and teleported to a secret level that's outside of the main game. This is when things start to get dubious. Let me know if I'm using the word dubious too much. I don't even know if I'm using it in the right context, but you know, whatever. So upon entering the level, you're immediately greeted with some text. Congratulations, you have proven yourself to be an open-minded and curious thinker. We must apologize for deceiving you, but we can reveal that the game you were playing until this point was a front constructed to protect what you are currently accessing. We must ask that you do not reveal this to the public, and if you cannot keep this a secret, close this program immediately. By selecting the yes option, you agree to participate and not reveal any information. Joke's on them. This isn't even legally binding. I can tell whoever I want. In fact, I just called up your mom a few minutes ago and told her all about it. Anyways, it goes on to say that this level is basically a thought exercise and it ends with the message, you may begin now. Welcome to your ascension. Once you get that message, you start the actual level, which is a series of puzzles. If you're able to solve all the puzzles in the secret level, you're presented with a blank white screen and some text. If you're able to solve all the puzzles in the secret level, you're presented with a blank white screen and some text, which congratulates you for figuring out the puzzles. It also says that they will contact you within a two week period and ask for your personal information, name, age, address, preferred wiping method, you know, the basics. And then the game just ends. So somebody actually data mined the game and posted their findings on the website Pastebin. And what they found was 
Pretty disturbing to say the least. He discovered that this secret level was an ARG used by a cult known as Ascensionism to recruit new members. Now, apparently Ascensionism has been around since at least 2006, and according to the religion wiki, it's often misunderstood as a cult, but they don't seem to exhibit any cult-like qualities. Mm, I don't know man, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that one. Kenny Veach, also known on YouTube as Snakebit McGee, left this comment on a YouTube video titled, Area 51 Technician's Son Discloses Secret Alternative Energy. In the comment, he claimed to have found a strange cave in Southern Nevada. I'm a long distance hiker. One time during one of my hikes out by Nellis Air Force Base, I found a cave. The entrance to the cave was shaped like a perfect capital M. I always enter every cave I find, but as I began to enter this particular cave, my whole body began to vibrate. The closer I got to the cave entrance, the worse the vibrating became. Suddenly, I became very scared and hightailed it out of there. This was one of the strangest things that has ever happened to me. I tried finding this comment on the video, but it must have been deleted, which is a little suspicious. Anyways, as you can see, this comment got a lot of attention and a lot of people were egging him on to go back to the cave. So he obliged and made a YouTube video about his search for the elusive cave. I'm looking for a cave that I, I found and I didn't have a, I didn't have a sidearm when I was here before and something about that cave just spooked me out of all the caves I've ever gone in. This one just made my body vibrate. The closer I got to it, the crazier my body felt. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to go in there right now, but I'm coming back someday. And I talked to some people on YouTube and I told them, hey, I'm coming out here, you know, because they, they kind of called my hand on it. So I don't know if there's going to be anything to it, but it, it might be interesting. Uh, if I can find it, I got to relocate it. And this is a big mountain range I'm in. But unfortunately, he couldn't find the cave. Well, I did not find the cave. That is so weird. I mean, I thought for sure I was just going to be able to find it. Um, I remember it being fairly easy. A little while later, Kenny would go out on another hike, but this one he would never return from. After a long search, police found his phone near an abandoned mine shaft, but the trail went cold after that. This led to tons of speculations and theories about what happened to him. Did he get whacked by the feds after stumbling upon a secret government experiment? Did he find the secret entrance to Area 51? Who knows, his body was never found. To make things even creepier, somebody left an ominous comment on the video where he went out looking for the cave. There were no updates for a while until his girl girlfriend left this comment on his YouTube video. I want you to know that I do not think Kenny had an accident. I believe he committed suicide. He battled depression for many years and would not take medication or see a doctor. He quit his job a little more than a year before he disappeared. The search for him was started within a couple of days of my call. Over 30 search and rescue team members searched three different times on foot. One helicopter flyover was done and there was no trace of Kenny or any of his camping things. They found his car in an area where I told them it would be. They did find his cell phone by the mineshaft in the video, and the mineshaft was only about a four hour hike from his car. It is my feeling that he left it behind so that he could not be tracked from the GPS in it. He also did not take his video camera with him on the solo hike. It was left in the home, so he had no intention of filming anything. He also said that if he decided to do it, no one would ever find him. It would be easy to do something like this in our desert with the high number of natural caves and mines. HLN also did a special about Kenny where they interviewed his daughter who came to the conclusion that Kenny just couldn't take society anymore and he left and started a new life in the desert. My biggest theory about his disappearance would be that he was just over it. I'm done, I'm gonna go find a new life and just dropping everything. The only thing that's suspicious about his girlfriend's comment is that she didn't even address anything about like the hidden cave or Area 51 or anything like that, which I thought was weird. You know, some people think that his family members were coerced by the government to say this stuff, you know, to get people off the trail, which I don't know, man. What, what do you guys think? Also, R.I.P. Kenny, you were an absolute legend. Hitogata is a lost Japanese commercial. It supposedly features two white characters standing in front of train tracks while a creepy sound plays. Here's a recreation that somebody made on YouTube. The hunt for this mythical commercial started back in 2004 on the website 2channel, which was like the Japanese version of 4chan. Now, I have no idea what any of this says, so let's move on. Baby monkey hate ring. This one is absolutely bananas. Okay, no pun intended, but seriously, this is one of the most bizarre entries on this video so far. So, for some reason, there are a ton of videos on YouTube of baby monkeys being hurt. Most of these videos are presented by animal rescuers and presented the monkeys getting hurt as a bad thing. 
but there's plenty of other videos where people just straight up abusing the little fellas. I'm not exaggerating the amount of videos. If you look up baby monkey hurt, there are so many freaking playlists full of these videos. It's insane. And some of the creators making these videos have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I don't even have 100,000 subscribers. What the heck's going on guys? Hit that mother sucking subscribe button. Anyways, back to what I was saying. The most fucked up thing about this whole situation is the comments. If you look deep enough, you'll find heaps of comments like this fantasizing about punching monkeys in the face and doing all sorts of sick stuff to them. This makes me absolutely sick. Hate against turtles, I understand. Specifically this turtle. But baby monkeys? Go suck yourself. So there's a couple of theories here. One is that it's just trolling or jokes. See, back in 1998, some guy named Paul Hughes made the website ifihadamonkey.com in which him and others would post jokes like this. If I had a monkey, I would buy him glasses and then punch him in the face. Eh, still funnier than Amy Schumer. So basically, these are supposed to be kind of like dead baby jokes, if you guys remember those. But yeah, that's the first theory. The second theory is absolutely vile, and I hope it's not true. Some people believe that these videos are like a fetish and that people pretend that these baby monkeys are baby humans and that, that just grosses me out even thinking about it but i think it, it's good to expose this stuff now there's a few clues to prove this theory first of all one of the most popular creators in this genre has a pretty weird name okay and let me tell you the cp does not stand for chris paul i can tell you that much there's another one of these channels that has straight up simulated coitus between two young looking people and to make matters even worse some of these videos they're even simulating something that rhymes with grape like look at this thumbnail bro the girl with the underwear and her ankles and the guy with his pants down what the heck 1.6 million views and it's not even age restricted all right, I just want to point that out. I can't even say queef more than three times in a video without getting age restricted, but somehow this video is, is perfectly fine for all audiences. You know, non-consensual non coitus, that's cool. And the theory goes even deeper than what I've talked about. Now, I've mentioned before in other entries that people can hide secret messages in the actual files of videos and images, and people think that there's some sick stuff hidden inside the files of these videos like passwords or like invites to weird chat rooms and things of that nature and w whatever it is it can't be good if you want to know more on this topic check out alec armruster's video called youtube's monkey problem where i got most of the info for this part from kate yup so we've all seen the lengths mukbang youtubers are willing to go to for views i mean you have nikocado avocado with whom it's hard to tell how much of his personality is faked for views and how much is genuine mental decline Another mukbang YouTuber by the name of Kate Yup has a kind of similar vibe going on. The Kate Yup channel features videos of a blindfolded French girl eating disgusting amounts of raw seafood. Now, on the surface level, these videos are absolutely bizarre, like even weirder than the average mukbang video, which is already weird in and of itself. Kate's videos in particular have a very weird vibe to them. I feel like I'm using the word weird too much, but anyways, it, it gets even stranger than the surface level weirdness. They're, again, in one video, she can be seen sporting a pretty nasty bruise on her arm and another wound on her lip. In another video, you can hear a voice in the background whispering things to her like, hurry up, just eat fast. These things combined with the general off vibe of the videos made people come up with all sorts of explanations. The most common of which being that Kate is kidnapped and being forced to make these videos in some kind of dungeon somewhere. She tried to dispel these rumors by following up with the video titled I Am Alive and this video just turned everything up to 10. Throughout most of her videos she has these annotations describing what she's eating. In this particular video, four of these annotations start with a capital letter and only four hey i'm still alive my friends you can see to my smile everything is okay for me look at me are you really thinking i'm forced to eat prawn just similar to giant shrimps and easier to eat because i removed the skin so if you take the first letter of each one of these phrases they spell out help and to top it all off she would only post two more videos after this i'm alive one and her last video was posted october 24 2019 this is creepy man I, I really hope this is an elaborate troll but to be honest this whole thing is truly more sus than a character from among us no but seriously i hope everything's okay in my head i'm choosing to believe that she's just trolling john lang was a former marine and political activist in fresno california who passed away tragically in 2016 
Some people have called him crazy and labeled him a conspiracy theorist, but after hearing all the details, you be the judge. So John had a history of being harassed by the Fresno Police Department over the course of seven years. He had a blog named JodyMurray.com where he documented his interactions with the police as well as his background with Fresno PD. According to him, his troubles started back in 2009. I'm just gonna read what he wrote. My situation starts back in 2009. I was ticketed two blocks away from a Home Depot. I later learned that Fresno law enforcement had a pattern of practice of unethically scanning license plates in private retail parking lots. They then pulled the unsuspecting drivers over a block or two away from said parking lots. This was meant to optimize ticket revenue at very minimal expense. Millions of dollars of revenue have been generated in this questionable manner by Fresno area law enforcement agencies. A pattern of practice that's still in use today. The added financial stress related to this incident crippled what was left of my marriage. I was devastated, angry, and upset. I thought the parking lot license plate scanning was abusive and simply designed as a revenue generating scheme. I voiced my opinion to the Fresno Bee, which is a local newspaper. I thought I was anonymous, but an employee named Jody Murray, remember the name of the blog is jodymurray.com. So John really wanted to put this mother sucker on blast. Jody Murray was feeding a known sheriff sergeant website log data containing identifiable IP address information that Fresno law enforcement used to track down citizens who were posting comments critical of Fresno PD. Within weeks, I was tailed by undercover sheriff officers who were routinely waiting on the street near my home. Along with this website, John also had a YouTube channel called Lang Marine, which contained 17 videos detailing the harassment John faced on a regular basis at the hands of the Fresno Police Department. I gotta be honest, watching these videos kind of blurred the line for me between reality and paranoia because some of these videos are pretty innocuous and he comes up with very speculative backstories. For example, this video with the title, Thank God the Feds Are Listening and Responding, which has this description. After corresponding with the FBI earlier this morning regarding the garbage truck incident, the Feds posted up outside my home in plain view this morning. Thank you, USG. But if you watch the actual video, it's literally just a van parked outside of his house. There's nothing weird about it, right? So I'm thinking maybe this guy is just schizophrenic, but then I kept watching his videos and I saw this one. That's like a $100,000 camera recording his house. He also has videos of cop cars stopping in front of his house briefly and then driving off, people suspiciously walking by and looking into his yard. There was this video of a group of police officers posted up right across the street from him, which looks like an intimidation tactic to me, like this is the type of shit gangs do. Then in another video, his security camera picks up somebody sneaking onto his property at 4.45 a.m. So at this point, I'm in complete conspiracy mode, okay? Let's, let's go back to the video with the minivan I was just talking about. Right after the van video, the next day, he posted another video titled Carpet Cleaning Van 656 Van Ness Avenue, Fresno, California Today. The video itself was footage of a carpet cleaning van parked right outside his house. On, on the surface level, doesn't seem out of the ordinary but then I realized these my suckers don't look like they're cleaning carpets. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the description of this video. If I turn up missing or dead tomorrow, remember this van. I think I seen a couple of guys sneak out of the side door into the building when it was parked in the carport this afternoon. He would also go on to make this post on his blog titled, an open letter to USDOJ and the FBI. In it, he would claim that Fresno law enforcement was trying to set him up on a bogus charge involving inappropriate videos of children. Then he ominously ends the post with this sentence, and with this letter, I have for certain signed my death warrant with Fresno LE. Then on top of the blog post, he would also make a Facebook post directed at local journalist named Corin Hoggard who works for ABC 30. Corin, you want some news? Corrupt Fresno cops are going to try and kill me this weekend, possibly tonight. This is not a joke. Now, I think you know where I'm going with this. A few days after that Facebook post, John would lose his life. His body was found in his home which had burned down. The Fresno coroner's office stated that the cause of death was inhalation of smoke and soot due to fire. Oh, and he also had three stab wounds in his chest, so that's a pretty important detail. Now, I'm no expert or anything, but I think, you know, if someone were to decide to take their own lives, they wouldn't stab themselves in the chest three times and then burn their house down. But hey, what do I know? The most mysterious metal song. <laughs> Most mysterious metal song. 
Mara Murray's disappearance. Mara Murray is a woman who went missing on February 9th, 2004 after being involved in a car accident. And the circumstances of her disappearance are very strange. Now, before we get into the disappearance itself, we need to talk about the events leading up to it because she exhibited like a weird pattern of behavior right before. A little bit of background on who Mara Murray was, she was a nursing student and track star at the University of Massachusetts. In November 2003, three months before she would vanish, Mara was arrested for and charged with credit card fraud after using a stolen credit card to buy food for multiple restaurants. After that, nothing eventful would happen for a while until February 5th, 2004. Mara would talk to her sister during her shift at work and her sister struggled with alcoholism and apparently was having a fight with her then fiance. After this phone call, Mara would go into a depressive state and begin to cry uncontrollably. It was so bad that she couldn't continue her shift at work and was escorted back to her dorm by her supervisor, Karen Mayotte. Walking and she wouldn't even um she wouldn't even like make eye contact with me. Like I she was when you walk in she heard the security um the desk the receptionist desk area was like directly in front of you walking into Melville. And she was like she was just like looking like past me. It was very weird. Because normally I wouldn't get that reaction from her, like going to visit, you know, visit with her. Would, um, I'd usually just smile and say, hi, walking in. But um, so I walk up. So she was like just staring out into space, like staring out the window. The window, those like large windows right next to the door. And um, so at that point, I was totally concerned just from that primary reaction from her. I wasn't sure how to, what to say next or like start a conversation because I was, I'm not an expert in like the psychology of like, it's, I knew she was extremely upset. I knew something was going on. So I asked her right away, I say, what's going on? What can I do for you? When I was talking with her, I just, I don't remember how long it took her for her to finally respond to me. I don't know if I was standing there for like one minute or like five. I don't know how much quiet time was between us. But eventually she said, my sister, because I, I don't know like if I kept asking her like over and over, like what's going on? What's going on? But it was, it was definitely some awkward like time in between where she was just staring, like just staring out the window, wouldn't even like engage with me. This is probably a fancy term with that with psychology. I don't know, but she wouldn't engage with me. But eventually, she just said, "My sister," and then um, she um, then she started crying. But she, it wasn't like a so, like a huge sob like you're. But she was just like she was. I would say like cr crying softly, it's like sob. I don't know, like crying softly, whatnot. So yeah, it's unclear exactly what they were talking about, but clearly something in that conversation with her sister bothered her. Two days after this incident, Mara's father would come visit her. They had dinner, and he let her use his car so she could attend a party later that night. So she goes to the party, has a couple of drinks with her friends, a little chit chat about boys and geopolitics or whatever girls talk about. But strangely, she didn't bring up her mental breakdown that she had at work earlier. At one point in the night, Mara said she wanted to return the car to her dad, but her friends found that strange because it was so late. Also, she was drinking alcohol and her dad didn't even expect the car until the next day. But despite all of that, Mara still decided to drive to the motel where her dad was staying at 2.30 a.m. But like I said, she was drinking boxed wine, so on the way to the motel, she crashed into a guardrail and messed up the car. Somehow, despite being intoxicated, she wasn't charged with anything, and the police gave her a ride back to where her father was staying, and she was distraught about what just happened, but her father consoled her and said that she seemed fine other than being upset about the car. The following day is when things start to get ominous. Mara emailed her professors and told them that she would be taking a week off from school due to a death in the family. But there was no death in the family. She then sent an email to her boyfriend who lived in Oklahoma which read, I love you more stud, got your messages but honestly I don't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promise I'll call you today though, love you, Mara. She then called the owner of a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire which she had previously stayed with her family. But she didn't make a reservation. She also called a motel in Vermont but again, didn't make any reservations. She also didn't inform anybody where she was going so it's hard to tell where her exact destination was supposed to be. Later that day she packed all her stuff and got ready to leave to who knows where and the weird thing is she didn't just pack clothes into a suitcase she took all the art off her walls and put all of her belongings into boxes so this kind of makes it seem like she was trying to go away for longer than a week but I don't know. After packing her stuff, she went to an ATM and withdrew $280. This was the last known photo of her. With the money, she used $40 to purchase alcohol, including Bailey's, Kahlua, and boxed wine. Bit of a weird combo, but hey, who am I to judge? She also stopped at the DMV to pick up some forms related to her previous car accident. And speaking of car accidents, Mara would crash her car a second time on February 9th around 7 p.m. The accident was spotted by a passerby named Butch Atwood, who offered to call the cops, but Mara claimed she had already called called roadside assistance. But Atwood called the cops anyways as soon as he got to his house, which was very close to the accident. I think he said it was
was around 500 feet or so away from where the accident happened. And Butch also claimed that the road was relatively busy, so other people would have seen her as well. But by the time police arrived on the scene, Mara was gone. The officers on the scene said there were no obvious signs of foul play and also no trace of anybody leaving the vehicle. It had been snowing pretty heavily in the area but there were no footprints in the snow and eventually a wider search was done but still no signs of her anywhere. It was said later during the search that they checked the west extensively but they didn't look east and that's probably where she went like that was the direction towards Bartlett where her father said she may have gone. It's worth mentioning that Mara took her cell phone and backpack full of stuff with her when she abandoned her vehicle. The original officer also also mentioned that there was a coke bottle full of wine in the cup holder so she'd been sipping a little bit. Yeah man she just completely vanished. No evidence has turned up since this happened from what I can tell. No cell phone, no remains, nothing. Absolutely nothing. The prevailing theory on what happened to her is that an opportunistic predator or serial killer abducted her. A more reasonable theory is that Mara was suffering from bipolar disorder and that combined with all the stressful things happening within a short period of time caused her to take her own life. It's also possible that she didn't want to get in trouble for drinking and driving and ruin her record of good behavior after her credit card fraud arrest so she thought running into the woods would be a good idea and maybe got lost and then the fourth theory which i think is unlikely is that she went up to vermont and basically started a new identity but i mean even even in the mid 2000s bro that shit was basically impossible all right yeah, trust me i've tried many times barbie.avi back in july 2009 somebody posted a creepy pasta on the x section of 4chan for those unfamiliar, X is dedicated to paranormal activity and conspiracy stuff. I'm gonna do my best to summarize this creepypasta as quickly as possible. So basically, this guy, we'll call him Lenny, finds an intact PC tower in the trash and decides to take it home with him. When Lenny hooked up the PC to his monitor, he noticed that there was a video file titled Barbie.avi hidden in the file directory. The video was described as being an hour long and featuring a woman doing what seemed to be an interview or something. The audio was drowned out with horse static that made it impossible to discern what she was saying. About 15 minutes into the footage, her face begins to redden and contort as if the questions are bothering her, but she continues to answer them anyways. She then begins to sob uncontrollable until at one point she's crying so hard she can barely look at the camera. The screen then fades to black, and after about two minutes of nothing, there was more footage which depicted what looked like train tracks. Lenny then got rock hard as he recognized the train tracks from a video and decided to investigate. So just like every other dumb character in a creepypasta does, Lenny goes to the train tracks and eventually stumbles upon a trail which leads him to an old abandoned house in a rusty shed. So he makes the genius decision to go inside the house and see what was in there. But while he was exploring their interior, he heard a loud moaning sound and ran out of there faster than me running out of your mom's bedroom when your dad comes home. Okay, so this is clearly another fake creepypasta written by somebody with a vivid imagination, right? Right? Well, there might be some truth to it, because about a month later, three videos were uploaded to a YouTube channel called Xenopasta that was created just a day before uploading. These videos were titled Barbie.avi, Barbie.avi Part 2, and Barbie.avi Part 4. No part three for some reason. The videos featured a young woman doing what seemed to be an interview and the audio was drowned out with horse static making it impossible to discern what she was saying. You can also see that as the interviewer, whatever it is, goes on, she seems to be visibly uncomfortable at some points. So the videos match up pretty clearly with what was described in the creepypasta. Well, flip me upside down, cover me in peanut butter, and punch me in the face. I think we've come across the first real life creepypasta, ladies and gentlemen. The first actually creepy creepypasta. I don't know why, but for some reason, the fact that it goes from part two to part four makes it way creepier for me. I, I, I can't explain why, it just makes it more ominous, dubious even. Now, the fourth video offers a little more insight onto what this could possibly be. It starts off with a caption that says B-I-I-D, and you also notice in this video that the woman is missing her right arm.
This led some people to come to the conclusion that this was a snuff film or something and somebody cut the girl's hand off. But other smarter people were able to deduce that BIID stands for Body Integrity Identity Disorder, which is a mental disorder in which a person thinks that part of their body doesn't belong there and they often remove the unwanted body part. So you can come to the conclusion that this woman cut off her arm because she was suffering from BIID and she was being interviewed by somebody to get a better understanding of the disorder, either for a medical journey journal or a documentary or something of that nature. So that does shed a little bit of light on the situation, but everything I said is purely speculative. Like it makes a lot of sense, but it's not proven. We still don't know who the woman is and who posted these videos and how he had access to them. So without much to go on, this was the prevailing theory. But then somebody stumbled upon another Barbie.avi video on the Chinese version of YouTube called Yuku. Really China? You, you couldn't make it a little bit more different. You know, it's like you're copying somebody's homework and barely change the answers. Anyways, this video was a much better quality and you can clearly see the girl and her arm. It's also not as garbled. I mean, still hard to hear anything, but I'm sure some schmuck took the time to transcribe every word she said. It's also important to mention that in this video, there's no BIID caption, which kind of disproves the body integrity identity disorder theory. Another thing is that the title of this video was Tammy. Then some people came across photos in an amputee magazine slash website called Ampix of a girl who looked very similar to Barbie. Case closed, right? Wrong! Apparently, somebody contacted the creator of Ampix and he said that the girl in the video was not, in fact, Tammy, but he did actually know who she was and claimed that her name was Sharon. Now, in my personal opinion, I'm not gonna trust a dude that runs an amputee magazine. Amputee magazine founders are notorious scumbags, almost as bad as used hot tub salesmen. I think that's Tammy, but who freaking knows, man. Port Mine is an abandoned mercury mine in Northern Nevada that was used back in the 1800s. I'm not sure if you're familiar with working conditions in the 1800s, but they were not good, okay? They didn't have workers comp. If you lost both your arms on the job, you better swing that pick with your feet or starve to death, buddy. These mother suckers never even heard the phrase workplace safety. That being said, this was a work mine, mine, so I'm sure none of them made it past 30. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of people perished in this mine, unfortunately, probably. Approximately 150 years after its heyday, this mine would still be accessible to modern day schmucks who have a weird hobby of spelunking, aka exploring caves and mines. One spelunker in particular, the owner of the Exploring Abandoned Mines and Unusual Places YouTube channel, posted a video of himself exploring the Horton Mine. Creepiest mine tunnels. Uh... I've ever uh, been in just because of how uh, dilapidated it is and all these chains hanging down from the overhead and there's a shot looking down the tunnel. Okay, here's a here's a shot looking back towards the entrance. I'm a little bit further in and uh, looking down the tunnel here. I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. Don't know if you can see that in the video or not. I mean, to be honest with you, I'd be surprised if the creepy abandoned mine wasn't haunted. Now, when I first saw this, I was thinking that the guy went and swung the chain himself and then got back into position. And that's what I'm gonna choose to believe, to keep myself sane. Also, I wanna mention this guy must have balls the size of pumpkins to go into an abandoned mine by himself like that. Anyways, after this video got posted to YouTube, it went pretty viral. The video was even featured on the Science Channel a fact to which the channel owner could not stop mentioning. Anyways, after the video got a ton of attention, Frank, the channel's owner, was egged on by the community to go back to the haunted mine. And a year later, he would cave and go back to the mine by himself. He would detail his exploration in a follow-up video titled Horton Mine, follow-up exploration of a creepy ghost-filled mine. And everything's going pretty good, the whole video, it's pretty calm, he's just talking about mining and stuff, and then things get a bit, well, I'll just show you. And... Okay, here's a final parting shot of the end of the Horton Tunnel. And uh, there's the uh, ore pass with all the cascading water. And um, what the fuck is that? Holy smokes, that was absolutely terrifying. I don't know what that was, 
But that just sounded like my ex-wife. In my head, I'm thinking that the first video was faked, he moved the chain himself, but then when he went back, the banshee shrieking was real because he was much less calm and collected in the second video and he ran out of there faster than me when the child support bill comes. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty bone chilling, but again, what do you expect? You're going in an abandoned mine. The chance of it not being haunted is incredibly slim. 973 et namu, 973. So if you look at this closely, it spells the human backwards. And if you go to their website, you're going to be greeted with a bunch of bizarre stuff. So I went in blind without reading anything about it. All right, going into this completely blind. Let's see. So I see the word maze. Let me click on the word. Okay, this is creepy. This is creepy. I don't know if I like this. Okay, uh, what the fuck? What is this? I am that I am. That is a verse from the Bible. Jesus says this when he asked, who are you? He says, I am that I am. Okay, uh, this is giving me the heebie-jeebies. I see a lot of uh, numerology, a lot of letters a lot of numbers reminds me of algebra and that terrifies me all right if i see an imaginary number in here dude i'm gonna shit my pants Let's see what else we got okay so now i don't really know how to get back to the okay here we go what's this middle one it's the same thing i think it's the same thing a bunch of uh numerology you click on stuff it takes you back to the same place what the fuck is this Man, this is giving me flashbacks, dude. Oh, gosh. Okay, in the name of... Oh, my goodness, dude. What is... Is this some cult stuff? Bro, I don't know, man. I, I, need, I need to get off this website, bro. This is... I'm probably on some sort of list now that I even entered here. So, yeah, from the brief moments I was poking around this website, it became clear that it's dedicated to numerology, which is like astrology, but for numbers. People who believe in numerology claim that numbers have powers and meanings, and the site also features a lot of religious symbolism. Like, you can see a lot of phrases from the Bible, there's a lot of stuff related to Buddhism and Egyptian mythology as well. There's also a bunch of weird images here that are pretty unsettling, to me at least. I also found an online forum dedicated to the subject, and some of the posts here are more disturbing than the website itself. Hello everyone, I will be frank. I spent at least five years studying this website and spent a lot of hours guiding myself through this maze. I can tell you the results, but it's dangerous. There is a side effect that affected me in a strange way. David Dennison, the creator of the site, was more than just a mathematician, linguist, artist, and occultist, but someone that is very versed in alchemy. The site is a puzzle and a maze, a series of dead ends and one path to navigate through it. Yet the ironic part of it is, it is one of those puzzles where you start at the beginning only to end up at the beginning. The only exception is that you have the key to the puzzle, which was right there in front of you the whole time. It makes perfect sense. I won't post the result here only because it works too well. I am happy to answer any questions in pertains to this site, but if you want to know the answer, I will not be accountable for any side effects that come after. Epiphany seeks the devoted. Man, fuck you. You didn't have the answer. You ain't got the answers, man. You ain't got the answers. I, you ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers. If you go through these forums, you'll find a bunch of other random ramblings of people sucking each other off because of how open their third eye is and how smart they are for deciphering numerological patterns in order to find the truth or whatever. You know what you need to decipher? You need to decipher a way to get some bitches. The posts on these forums are very cult-like and just creepy, man. I, I don't like this shit. I don't like this stuff. Well, I mean, what the heck is this website anyway? Is it an ARG or some kind of cult recruitment tool? Or is it just the ramblings of an insane mathematician who got a hold of some designing software? Well, I don't know for sure, but I think I can provide a little bit of insight. People were able to find out that the website's domain was registered to David Dennison, a British artist. Fraternal greetings, people of planet Earth. Welcome to the Starship. <laughs> As you can see, he's exactly the type of person who would make a website like this. You can also see a lot of his artwork on one of the pages of his website that I showed you guys earlier. Anyways, I think this entry creeped me out probably more than anything else so far, and I'm probably gonna go to church this Sunday to cancel it out. Jeff the Killer original image. So, Jeff the Killer is one of the most famous creepypastas. If you've ever felt the touch of a woman, you've probably never heard of this story, so I'll summarize it quickly. My name is Jeff. Okay, no, seriously, here it is. The story starts off with a kid who woke up in the middle of the night and saw that his door was opened. When he goes to close it, he sees a terrifying looking man who told him to go to sleep. 
The creepypasta was also accompanied with this photo. Hi sisters! Anyways, this horrendous looking fella then attacked the kid with the knife and somehow the kid fights off the crazed lunatic killer long enough for the neighbors to call the police. And then Jeff runs away and the police weren't able to find him. By the way, I highly recommend you guys go check out the original Jeff the Killer story. It's actually hilarious how badly written it is. I wouldn't be surprised if this was written by a 12 year old. Like, how the fuck? There's a dude who looked like this escape with a face like that, all right? He sticks out like a sore thumb. If I was walking down the street and I saw this guy minding his own business, eating frozen yogurt or something, I'm calling the police, bro. I'm not just gonna keep that to myself. The story is then followed up by an origin story for Jeff. He was a normal kid like you or me. He moved to a new neighborhood with his family and immediately started getting bullied by a group of kids. One day these kids stole his brother's wallet so Jeff pulled some John Wick shit and beat all three of the bullies up, breaking one of their arms. Then a few weeks later Jeff's mom forced him to go to one of the bullies parties to make amends. And then, I shit you not, the bullies pull out guns and hold the entire party hostage so that they could beat up Jeff without anyone stepping in. These are like 14 year old upper middle class kids doing this. Anyways, they eventually pin Jeff down and dump alcohol and bleach all over his face and then light it on fire and then... He basically turns into the Joker, like he went crazy and went on a killing spree and even kind of looks like the Joker, if you ask me. He also cut a permanent smile into his face, like it's so dumb dude, it's so, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I, when I say how dumb this story is. So now that we've got that horrendously bad story out of the way, let's talk about the origin of this creepy photo. Because let's be honest, this photo was a hundred times scarier than that bullshit I just read. The photos are actually used years before this creepypasta even appeared on the internet. The original story of Jeff was actually created by a YouTuber by the name of Cesar who posted the video along with this image back in 2008. He also had another image of Jeff that was slightly different than the famous one. So where did Cesar get these images from? One theory is that the picture is actually a photoshopped image of a woman named Katie Robinson. According to this theory, Katie posted a photo of herself on 4chan around 2008. She was then bullied and harassed relentlessly due to her weight, and 4chan members began to photoshop her face and then the results were Jeff the killer. But that claim has been mostly debunked. Also, why would you post a picture of yourself on 4chan? It's not my space. Like, I'm sexy as shit and have almost no flaws. And I wouldn't post a picture of myself on 4chan. That's just asking for trouble. So Cesar, the creator of the original Jeff the Killer video, debunked this Katie story and said that the image is actually a photo of him wearing a latex mask. But Cesar is also a lying schmuck because the earliest confirmed sighting of this image was on a Japanese message board named Pia.cc in 2005, predating Cesar's video by a whole three years. So what's the truth? Who cares? I honestly don't know why I wasted so much time on this one. Laughing Horse Orifice Headquarters. This is another weird website, and I went in blind once again just to get my genuine first reaction to everything. Oh, and keep in mind that this website has a lot of flashing lights and also nudity and possibly MK Ultra mind control shit. So please take all of this into consideration before watching this next part. Skip forward about a minute and a half if you don't want to see any of that. All right, we got another weird website. Let's see, this is clickable. What the fuck? What the heck was that? Okay, was that even allowed on YouTube? I don't know. Okay, I see a bunch of words, colors. This person is the founding president of the American Iranian Council where Chaz Friedman, okay. Uh, what's the, what, what, what does this mean, man? It's a lot of text and it's, it's cut off too. It's the weird thing is that it's cut off. Okay, so I'm guessing there's like hidden things. There we go, Prince Andrew. Okay. Oh, what the heck? Who's this guy? Is that Jean-Claude Van Damme? Angela Merkel? What the fuck? Dude, this website is like... It knows things. Alright? It's hiding messages in plain sight. Or something. I don't fucking know what's going on. Alright, let's see what's over here. Oh, that looks like a woman in a pantsuit. What the fuck is this?
As you can see, the website contains a lot of references to conspiracies and things of that nature. Everything about this is so bizarre. It starts off pretty innocuous looking like a regular shitty website, but you notice right away that things are off in the homepage. These entries are all gibberish. Acts of embryo, owners of a local ballot sources acting, what the fuck is this man? It makes even less sense than when my girlfriend gets mad at me for emotionally manipulating her, whatever that means. But yeah, this website itself is like an iceberg. It starts off simple and the deeper you go, the weirder it gets. And you're constantly seeing more and more stuff as you, you know, focus on the pages. There's so many random names and conspiracies and things that are seemingly random and make no sense at all. There's text hidden everywhere in multiple different languages and if you look hard enough you can even find content information for politicians and other influential people like you can spend hours upon hours combing through this website while you slowly descend into insanity I don't want to spend a lot of time on this entry because I'm scared if I spend too much time on this site I'm gonna wake up in Russia with no memory of my past life with an M4 in my hand standing on top of the ashes of what used to be a rural Russian village as I hear the screams of the residents in the background Ruth Price Ruth Price was a woman who placed a call to 911 sometime in the 80s about a guy who was snooping around her house Here's a clip of the call. Uh, this is uh, Ruth Price of 3877. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been um, checking the place out. How? Oh. Well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And... Yes. And uh, said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Mm -hmm. I'm where, where is he now, ma'am? I don't have no idea. <laughs> was chilling. The story circulating around the internet was that this woman was murdered by the intruder in her home, probably because the title of this video was Elderly Woman Murdered During 911 Call. And with not much else information to go off, this was the main narrative surrounding the call. But as with all things on the internet, that's not entirely true. As the call made its way around the internet, people who worked in or with law enforcement claimed to have heard this call during training as an example of what not to do during a 911 call. But there's not a lot of proof to go on other than trust me bro. But while there's no way to prove that it was used for training calls, it is actually possible to prove what happened to Ruth Price. So when she calls 911, you can hear her say, this is Ruth Price at 3877, before rudely getting cut off by the operator. Uh, this is uh, Ruth Price of 3877. What's the problem, ma'am? So with the knowledge that this phone call was made in California, along with knowing that her address has 3877 in it, people were able to find this newspaper article in the San Diego Tribune, which matched her information and says that Ruth was grabbed from behind and choked. She was able to break the attacker's grip and ran away afterwards. Man, how much of a schlemiel do you have to be to get overpowered by an old woman? Who, who, who broke into her house, bro? Joe Pesci from Home Alone? Shout out to Ruth though, man. But unfortunately, the burglar was not caught. I also tracked down Ruth's obituary, which states that she passed away in 1994 at the age of 80, which confirms that she survived the ordeal, but holy smokes, man, that's a terrible thing to go through when you're in your 60s. When I'm in my 60s, the only person I want choking me is my 25-year-old girlfriend trying to snuff me out so she can inherit my fortune that I left to her in my will after letting her manipulate me into signing everything I own over to her. Charles Peck phone calls. Now, you guys know, that when it comes to mysterious things, I hate reasonable explanations that are grounded in reality. I always go for the paranormal explanation, and in this case, is no different. But I'm getting ahead of myself, let's start at the beginning. On September 12, 2008, a Metrolink commuter train collided head-on with a Union Pacific freight train in the Chatsworth neighborhood of Los Angeles. The crash would leave 135 people injured and was caused 25 people to lose their lives. One of the people involved in this crash was a man by the name of Charles Peck. Now, here's where things get a bit paranormal. Soon after the incident, Charles' cell phone began placing call after call to his family. His son, brother, stepmother, sister, fiance, they all received calls from Charles, 35 total over the course of 11 hours. During these calls, he didn't actually say anything. It was just static. Now, while these calls were happening, Charles was missing and emergency responders tried to track his cell phone in an effort to find Charles. Eventually, they did locate him and it turns out Charles died on impact. His phone was never found. Now, you could say this is a phone malfunction, but why did only his close loved ones receive these calls? Maybe it just cycled through his most frequent contacts? I don't know. 
The other possible explanation is that his whole family was trying to troll, but that's highly unlikely. I mean, you tell me this entire group of people were troll right after the loved one passed away tragically? So possible, yes, but very, very improbable. Barely Sociable had the theory that Charles actually did not pass away on impact and survived and made these phone calls before he was found. And I really hope that's not true. Uh, I don't know, man. What do you guys think? Paris Catacombs Found Footage The Catacombs of Paris are a massive sprawling system of tunnels underneath the city of Paris, France. They originally started out as a stone quarry, but when the graveyards of Paris started to get overcrowded, they would put the deceased down there. Today it's home to the remains of over 6 million people. If you go down there, it's something straight out of a video game. When you're not walking through narrow claustrophobic tunnels, you can see thousands of bones and skulls organized neatly into piles or walls. This is some creep show shit, man. Part of these catacombs are open to the public as a museum, but like I said, the system of tunnels is absolutely massive, so most of it is closed and actually illegal to explore. But the law doesn't stop dumb people from doing dumb things. Every year, hundreds of weirdos go deep into the catacombs, in fact, there's entire groups of people who make this a hobby. In 2004, police discovered a whole ass movie theater in the catacombs, complete with an audience seats, projection equipment, and a fully stocked bar. But not everyone's lucky enough to enjoy a nice film in a mojito in the catacombs. People who are inexperienced get very easily lost. It's pitch black down there and people have been known to go missing. One of the most ominous videos of the Paris catacombs was found in the 90s. It shows a man who is exploring deep inside. At one point, he starts to run, seeming in a panic and he keeps running faster and faster at one point he drops his camera and keeps running the camera continued to record until it ran out of battery so is this guy in a panic because he's lost or is he being chased by something either way can't be good we hear his breathing get louder and louder uh, as though something was scaring him he was he's, he's frightened he's frightened occasionally he stops perhaps to try to decide which way to run among all the many different corridors He's running faster and faster and faster, deeper and deeper into the catacombs. And all of a sudden, we hear his breathing get louder and louder, uh, as though something was scaring him. He was, he's, he's frightened, he's frightened. Deeper and deeper into the catacombs. And all of a sudden... Now, this video's first appearance was in a show called The Scariest Places on Earth. The episode featured film director Francis Friedman attempting to find out what happened to the unknown man behind the camera. I think I saw this on the tape. This, this figure with the arms outstretched, the legs outstretched. And I think after this, the camera turns right. Francis and his crew traveled for hours deep into the catacombs trying to find any trace he could of the man. After 12 hours of searching, they couldn't find anything to lead them to him. See, this is why I'm always saying, don't explore a giant underground maze by yourself. It's never a good idea. We didn't solve the mystery. I don't think anyone ever will. There's too many, too many, too many miles of, oh fuck, of tunnels in there. But we'll never understand what's fighting. Whoever it was that dropped the state. Red Rooms. Have you ever let your loneliness get the better of you to the point where you go to one of those cam girl sites? You know, the ones where there's some woman with a C-section scar lying on a bed in some shithole apartment in Florida with a dildo the size of Shaq's forearm next to her, while her kid's probably in the next room with noise-canceling headphones pretending like everything's normal? Well, in these cam girl rooms, you can tell the woman to do whatever you want her to do, in exchange for money, of course. Or, at least that's what I've heard. <clears throat> so a red room operates similarly to a cam girl show. The difference being that instead of a girl with a GED pretending she's into you for money, it's a person strapped to a chair being tortured. Essentially red rooms are a live stream of a person who was kidnapped and trapped in a room. Viewers can pay money in the form of cryptocurrency to decide how this person is going to be treated or if they get to live or not. Obviously this isn't something you can look up on bing.com, this is some deep web stuff. But a lot of people don't know if these red rooms are real or just an urban legend. You know, if you do a little bit of research, you always hear stories about people accidentally stumbling on red rooms. Yeah, just like I accidentally stumbled into your mom. Let me tell you something. When it comes to shit like this, you don't accidentally stumble on it, okay? It's stories like this that make it incredibly difficult to tell what's real and what's fantasy. Thankfully, there's about 20,000 articles about this very topic. So long story short, yes, they are most likely real, but not in the way most people think. First of all, they're not available on the deep web. 
I'm not gonna get into the intricacies, but basically to get on the deep web, you need something called a Tor browser to access it. And this Tor browser is basically impossible to live stream on. And the whole point of a red room is that it's a live stream of somebody getting brutalized. That's not to say these things don't exist because obviously horrible, screwed up and disgusting videos exist on and off the internet. But these things aren't just widely available on the deep web. It's most likely secret websites that you need an invite and a background check to access, like secret exclusive clubs that only a few people with a sick fetish and a lot of money know about. It's Squid Game shit, man. It's, it's basically Squid Game shit. October 28, 2011.com. If you try to go to this website now, you're not gonna find anything because the website was taken down for unknown reasons in 2015. This is another strange website with hidden things just like the other ones we've covered so far. And just like the other ones, I'm going in blind, baby. Okay, so since the website doesn't exist anymore, I'm gonna be using the Wayback Machine. And interestingly enough, the date October 28th, 2011, wasn't actually archived. You would think that if they were gonna archive this page on any date, it would be that one, but that, that's okay, that's fine. I'm gonna pick uh, October 7th since that's the biggest circle. So here's, uh, you see this tunnel, Ill, I don't know, bro, just a bunch of nonsensical stuff. You click here, it's a picture of Schrodinger's cat for some reason. All right, there's also some, some music. You guys can hear that. Yeah, just all around creepy vibe. Creepy vibe. I don't like it. I don't like this. Um, it's like every other website. Just, you know, stupid philosophical bullshit. Let's see here. What's what's over here? The record. All right, show me the record. What the fudge is this, dude? Hurt my derp. Oh, my. And it downloaded something? I, what the heck, dude? That's weird, man. Okay, let's see what- I'm definitely not gonna accept that download, bro. Get the heck out of here. Okay, so when you get here, you can see, like, a step-by-step -step process on how to do something. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but- Hey, what the fuck is this, bro? Is that blackface? Oh my goodness. On top of all the creepy shit, the website's also racist. You know what? I refuse to go any further. So yeah, as you can see, it's pretty cryptic, pretty ominous, pretty dubious, just like the other weird ass websites. I mean, there's not much left to say, man. I barely have any sanity left and I'm not gonna use it to do a deep dive on this website. Let's move on. Mariana's Web. So you've probably heard of Mariana's Trench and in case you're unfamiliar, it's the deepest part of the ocean. And let me tell you, this bad boy is deep, okay? It's deeper than those 2 a.m. conversations with the fellas after a couple of brewskis. This area has been largely unexplored and the deepest parts of it are impossible to reach with Today's technology. Mariana's web follows this concept in that some areas of the internet are impossible to reach by anyone, or almost anyone. The concept of this comes from this iceberg chart that's much more in depth than your standard internet iceberg, and the last layer of it is Mariana's web. There's pretty much no mention of that phrase or term prior to this post, but in theory, the only way to access Mariana's web is by solving a quantum computing process known as polymetric false single derivation. That's not right, polymeric false single derivation there we go and to do that you need a quantum computer which not every schmuck just has lying around okay like only nasa and a few other organizations have access to a quantum computer and supposedly if you're able to do that and access all of mariana's web stuff you can find all sorts of juicy stuff like historical archives government secrets obama's last name and the location of my dad well guys that's about all i have left let me know in the comments what you guys think and if you enjoyed this video please Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, like I said, this is gonna be two parts, okay? I originally intended for it to be one part, but I quickly realized that that was not gonna happen with the time constraints that I have. So yeah, please turn notifications on so you guys know when part two comes out because YouTube recommendations are notoriously unreliable for that kind of stuff. And please make sure to check me out on all other social media. Everything's in the description of this video. Also, I have a Patreon now. If you feel like you haven't wasted enough money in your life, please feel free to donate. Speaking of Patreon, shout out to Omicron420, Zane Stevens, Spurgalicious Asshat, Zazafi, and the rest of you beautiful mother suckers for keeping this channel running. If I could kiss every single one of you right now, I would. But hopefully this shout out will do. Anyways guys, as always, thank you for watching. Later.